I'm Jennifer Abshire, and today we're on the front porch with really one of my favorite people, Jessica Levitt. I'm such a fan. She's the editor of The Scout Guide, and thank you. Thanks for being here today. It's my pleasure. <laughs> I'm excited to talk to you because of the recent changes with The Scout Guide, but tell everybody really how it got here. Sure. So The Scout Guide is a coffee table style book. It's a curated collection of all local businesses. And so we really try to create a beautiful sort of visual feast for you and pique your interest about interesting local businesses. So I started The Scout Guide in Savannah about, gosh, two and a half years ago now? Whoa. <laughs> and um, I saw The Scout Guide from Charlottesville, Virginia, because my partner's aunt is from there and she brought me a copy of the guide and I just fell in love with it. And I saw it, I was like, oh, what is this? I need to know more. Went on their website, um, found out that there were options for bringing it to your city. And I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> so brought it to Savannah, um, took the plunge, and I ran it myself for about 18 months. And then at the concurrent time, there was another company that um, also had bought the rights to this Hilton Head, Buford, and Bluffton Scout Guide. And so we had become friends, we'd been comrades, we've been you know, commiserating with the same problems. Um, and so then we kind of joined forces and rolled in together. That's yeah. great. So are you the editor of both? Um, well, I'm sort of the point person for both. I, I can't be on the ground as much as I would like to be for Hilton Head, Buford, and Bluffton, so I don't consider myself the editor there. Um, more just kind of the production assistant, social media maven, et cetera. Okay. What I find fascinating about the Scout Guide, and if you haven't seen it, but the cool thing about the Scout Guide is it's so visually appealing, and there's very little copy. Yes. And for someone who runs a PR firm, you know, we get paid to write a lot of copy, but I think the picture, it just, it says everything. And how are you capturing that, and what are the challenges that are behind that just moment? <laughs> yes. So that moment is one in thousands of moments is what everyone needs to know first of all we never get it on the first shot um, but i do work with my clients one-on-one -on -one, really closely trying to make sure we know the message that we want to portray so maybe a brand has a new product that they're launching in the year while the scout guide is out well clearly we want that to be at the forefront of that shot because that's right. what they're really focusing on that year so i sit down with my clients we have a creative meeting that usually is somewhere between 30 minutes to 90 minutes where we discuss where are we going to shoot this what are you going to wear how do we portray this emotion through a photograph. Yeah. And then I'm so fortunate to work with such creative, amazing photographers. Um, I worked with Leanne Rich for my first volume. Fabulous. The second volume, I worked with Cedric Smith on a few shoots. I worked with an amazing photographer out of Bluffton who I'll be working with for volume three named Christian Lenoy. And they just bring such an awesome energy and eye to the process. I couldn't do it without them. Absolutely not. Is it online? Yes. So are, do you get the double benefit. What are, you, are you finding, though, that people are going online, or is it still that physical book that they're attracted to? You know, it's a mix of both. Uh, because it's so visual, Instagram has been awesome for me because it's a perfect social media platform for a book that's all about pictures. It's beautiful. Um, so I found that people find the physical copy, and then they'll usually track to my blog, and then they'll sign up for my newsletter, which is great, because that's just a roundup of what I've got going on on the blog. And Or people will find me on Instagram and then seek out a physical copy of the book based on my Instagram feed. It's great. So it's great to have both components, and you can also flip through the book digitally, too, which is great if you're from another city and planning to visit Savannah. Yes. It offers that opportunity for cross-promotion between the Scout Guide cities. So. Tell us where the Scout Guides are located. So you can find them at any of my member businesses, which you can find on my website, savannah.thescoutguide.com, um, or you can pick them up at select hotels, the Bohemian and the Mansion on Forsyth. And I have um, rack cards at the Visitor Center on MLK, so that will give you all the information. And if you want one, just reach out to me. You can email me. I'd love to drop one off for you. That's great. Mm -hmm. I, I have found secretly that there are people who are keeping the Scout Guide. <laughs> Instead of buying coffee table books, they're putting, you, putting mm -hmm. that book basically on the table. That's a perfect use for them. Yeah, share it with a friend if you have someone visiting. Or go on an adventure and check out a place you've never been to. So who's reading the Scout Guide? So 
I like to think everyone is, but <laughs> mainly I target women. Um, it seems to appeal to them a little bit more than men. Um, but from ages 25 to 65 and more. I mean, uh, my grandma loves to look at it and she doesn't live in Savannah, so. <laughs> Tourist, local? I really aim at a local audience. I do a super targeted approach. So there's only 20,000 copies of the books printed in Savannah, but I really try to get it into the hands of locals who will become repeat buyers or users of your service. So, what I love about the Scout Guide is it is that moment in time for our region. Mm -hmm. You, when you glance at it, you see the sophistication, you see also the beauty, but you see the smarts. And I just I thank you for the product because I think that it's really fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much. I I do try to capture the personality of the city. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Again, we're with Jessica Levitt with the Scout Guide. Happy to be on the front porch with her today. Thanks for being here. Oh, thank you. Hi, and welcome to today's front porch. Today we're talking with Andy Schwartz of Grow, Eat, Repeat. Hi, Andy. How are you? Great. How are you? Wonderful. Thanks. We're so glad you're here. Thanks for having me. Tell us about Grow, Eat, Repeat. What are you up to? Okay, so Grow, Eat, Repeat is basically um, my little, you know, compost child, I guess you could call it, in kind of a weird way. Um, I've, I've been working on farms around Savannah for, I don't know, five or six years now and very quickly realized the importance of, of good soil. So once I started growing food in good soil, I said, wow, this is totally different than what it used to be, and just kind of became interested in soil life and soil food web and, you know, how much of a difference a good bucket of soil makes. Sure. Um, had some friends that worked in restaurants and knew a little bit about that industry myself and kind of started reading more and more about food waste and, you know, how much of an impact it has on the environment how much Americans actually produce, which is significant. I mean, the average American produces about 250 pounds a year. Mm -hmm. So you think about that, um, a fast pitch recently, you know, there were about 100 people. So, you know, that's a lot of waste mm -hmm. if you think about just a couple people together. So then I said, okay, well, there's two problems. Soil is, is eroding quickly and we need good soil to grow in. And there's a lot of food waste. Mm -hmm. So how can I put those two things together to come up with a solution? And how did you? Um, just started talking to restaurants and saying, hey, you guys, you know, I mean, I know you're throwing this stuff out. I know you're lugging these heavy bags of food waste out to the dumpster and they're spilling and it's hard for your employees and blah, blah, blah. So I just said, I'll provide you some clean bins, uh, a regular pickup service uh, twice a week if that's what you need, whatever. Just kind of worked with the restaurants on a pickup mm -hmm. and just started collecting it and kind of started doing it in my backyard for a little bit. Just it was only like one or two restaurants, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, shortly after that, uh, I was up to six, seven, eight restaurants. Now I'm at about 15, a couple of schools, a couple Great. other businesses. Yeah. And so then, is it still in your backyard? Where oh, are no. you? What are you doing on the other end? <laughs> no, I wish, I, well, I kind of wish it wasn't, wasn't. It was nice to be able to see it all of the time and make sure that I was maintaining everything the way that I wanted it to. And I'm still able to do that. So there's one piece of property in Savannah City Limits out at the old dairy farm. Are you mm -hmm. familiar with that place? I'm not. Uh, tell us a little bit about maybe where it uh, is. It's out, on, it's out off of Bonaventure Road. Uh, okay. Tennessee Avenue basically okay. dead ends into an old dairy farm that, as far as I know, has been out of operation for, you know, since the late 80s or something. Great. But there's a lot of property out there. Um, some buildings are still remaining. They've refurbished a lot of that stuff. So there's workspace out there. There's farmland out there and that's where the composting is now taking place. Okay. Is out on that piece of property. And then once it's compost, then what happens with it? A uh, majority of what happens is there's, a, there's, two di there's three different businesses going on out there. So there's Savannah Victory Gardens. They do edible landscaping and garden maintenance. Uh, they have a nursery out there. So a lot of the finished product goes to their plants sure. and their maintenance. Uh, and then there's a small farm that's also operating out there, uh, about an acre worth of production. And majority of what I use goes to them. Okay. So I'm not really paying a rent or anything in a dollar amount. I'm basically just providing them soil and they're providing me a place okay. to do that. 
So how quickly did you go from the two restaurants in your backyard to 15 and a separate facility? A um, little over a year, maybe. A little, maybe like a year and a half. Okay. So right now, with, with those number of restaurants and schools all said and done, I'm diverting about 25 tons of food waste wow. every, every month. Wow. So, I mean, it's, it's a significant amount of, of food waste that's being kept out of the landfill and being used to create something beneficial. And then the revenue model is on the restaurant side, on the, on the pickup side. Right. It, it is currently, and that was some of the feedback that I received from Fast Pitch recently, mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, the, the service is, is, is a payment, right? So you have to pay for that. And then the other end of it, I originally kind of started with this, you know, idea of community gardens and just putting the soil where it was needed and mm -hmm. there wasn't really nobody was paying me for anything it was just they would host the space and then I would give them soil so it was kind of helping both of us um, and I, I think that's a great model and I'm, st I'm not still I'm going to do that but making some money on the other end of it on the finished product is really where I need to be focusing my time and that's kind of where I'm headed in the next couple months and the rest of the year is, is doing that. Great. Um, so you talked about fast pitch a little bit. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit more about your experience and some of your takeaways. I thought it was a great experience. I mean, I've, I've heard of it. I've been around Savannah for eight, nine years, and I've always kind of heard of it and known people that have participated and just kind of decided that it was good timing for me to do it this year. Um, I think the environment was great leading up to it. Creative Coast was awesome with coaching and, you know, Wonderful. doing all those type of things. So I would definitely recommend it to anyone that's interested. Uh, and then the feedback I got from the judges and, you know, just people that were in the audience was awesome. You know, people really loved what I was doing. They thought it was very much needed and saw the value in it. So I just hearing that and kind of having that confirmation from people outside of my normal group mm -hmm. was, was really encouraging. So that was great. That's what we love to hear. Yeah. And then tell me, so you say, thinking about the product side, mm -hmm. what does that mean specifically? Well... I think that what I, what I want to do is kind of get people away from the idea of going to, you know, like a big box store to buy a bag of compost that's in a bag. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you don't know how long it's been out there. It's, number one, it's in a plastic bag, and it's just the quality is not, like, I, that's kind of why I started doing it is because I didn't want to use that stuff in my own garden. So my goal is to, you know, have people coming out to the farm, you know, getting truckloads, selling it in bulk, kind of like that. And then, you know, I, I, every time I go to an event or do a workshop or something, I'm always have the soil available for people to purchase. And that information is all on my website and everything for, for folks that are interested. And the website, is it just grow, eat, repeat? Yeah, it's just grow, dash, eat, dash, repeat. Wonderful. Yep. Um, so when you were thinking about taking a leap and starting your own thing, kind of what were some of the things that motivated you to do that? Well, just the need for... Um, like, like I originally mentioned, just the need for good quality soil and the need to reduce uh, harmful emissions at the landfill. I mean, that, that was seriously the two most motivating pieces. Once I kind of put those two pieces together, I said, you know, I, I have to be doing this. Um, and I think that some of the feedback that I received of, hey, this is great. Is this your hobby or is this your job? Mm -hmm. You know, because I mean, I think you can kind of look at something like this and think, hey, this is a green thing and this is cool and, you know, that's awesome, but, like, is it a sustainable business model? And I think that's where I'm really trying to focus on is, is showing people that this is a very viable business. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you're, people pay for waste management no matter where they are, residents, businesses, whatever. Um, so this is an alternative to sending your waste to a landfill where it's going to be costly for taxpayers and for the government because... Maintaining a landfill is very expensive, and they only have a definite life. So once they're full, you got to build another one. Uh, what has surprised you in starting up Grow, Eat, Repeat? Um, the, the, actually seeing the amount of food waste. I mean, mm -hmm. I always knew that it was there, but, you know, when I, when I go to these restaurants and do these pickups, it's just, my goodness, you know. People just don't have a real awareness of what that looks like. And yeah. to me, I'm very, you know, kind of used to it at this point, but mm -hmm. for the first couple months, that once I got a good volume of restaurants, I was just kind of shocked by how much it was. So, to, so how should individuals, like how do, how do individuals get that gut check on how much there is? What's the best kind of 
way for people to think about that? Right. Um, I, I think that the best way to do it is, is the residential piece. And that, mm -hmm. that's another thing that I'm trying to focus on this year is just doing a little bit at home. You know, what, once, because you're really taking that banana peel or whatever it is, and instead of throwing it in your trash, you're putting it in a bucket right next to your trash. Mm -hmm. So I'm just tr trying to get, and I do it to a lot of my friends. I, you know, it's, it's not the right way to do it to residents and people at large, but just be like, hey, why are you doing that? You know, what, what are you doing? Um, that could be going to something better. Yeah. So I think that once somebody just kind of either hears how much an individual produces or once they see it, just, just think about it next time you take out your trash. How much of that stuff could actually go to a, a compost bin? Mm -hmm. How much of it can be recycled? And then what should people be looking for in good compost? You mentioned there is compost on the market, but it's not a quality you trust. So what makes quality compost? Uh, the life. Um, so when you buy something at a store, you know, it, it's, I'm not to say that it's lifeless or anything, but the, the quality and the, the microbial activity and the different types of insects and everything that are in there are probably not going to be present unless it's extremely fresh, which is not likely to be found. So that, that's my focus, is the stuff that I have, is it's, it's not bagged, it's not anything like that, it's, it's just sitting there waiting to be used. Mm -hmm. So when you take a shovel full of this, you're going to see worms, you're going to see little roly-polies, you're going to see all kinds of stuff, and then there's going to be hundreds of thousands of other things that you don't see, the, the soil life. Sure. Um, tell me what you enjoy most about operating along the Creative Coast. Yeah, I think that uh, the Creative Coast is just awesome because I'm from the Midwest, and I've been down here for a while now, and, you know, a lot of people have this kind of backwards notion of, like, the Deep South or whatever, and I, and I think that where we are and what we have going on is just, it's really encouraging, and to, to see people have the response that they've had to what I'm doing and to know other people in the similar market and just, it, it's just, it's different, and I, and I think that getting that across to people of, you know, South Georgia is not just you know, tobacco fields and whatever most people think of, but this is, this is a very progressive city and there's a lot of cool things happening here. So I think that it's really cool. Great. Yeah. Is there anything else we should know about Grow It Repeat, what you're up to? No, I mean, I'm, I'm wearing a shirt here that says, feed the food that feeds you. And that, that to Great me, tagline. That's, my, you know, that's the whole concept behind my business is it's, you gotta be smart about what you're doing because what, what you put in is obviously what you're gonna get out. So it's, it's not food, it's not, anything specific it's kind of a life concept too of you know what you put in is what you get so yeah. that's it for me wonderful well thanks so much for being here and for sharing with us today we really appreciate it thank you very much absolutely great this month on city span a close-up look at savannah's biggest party it's a huge deal we're the hostess with the mostest we host party need to find your way around look no further than the city's new colorful additions so cut your lawn, park in the driveway. If not, code enforcement will come calling. We're gonna hoop it up, throw in a bank shot, and hit a home run highlighting Ardsley Park. Savannah Source for news, information, and entertainment. Only on SGTV City Span. Daily at 11, 3, 7, and 11. Comcast Channel 8. Okay, today we're delighted to have Susan Isaac come and join us for a second podcast here on the front porch. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. Susan's one of the principals at Paragon Design and a previous board member at the Creative Coast. Paragon is a multidiscipline design company here in Savannah, web strategists, design developers, animation, motion graphics, branding, and print design. Did I miss anything? No, you got it okay. all. Your company's grown in all directions in terms of clients, capabilities, and your talented team, and some quite specialized services that you now offer. Would you like to um, tell us a little bit about that growth? Sure. So we've been very fortunate um, over the years to work with uh, varied clients and uh, evolve our service offerings based on what they needed. Um, one of the areas in the last few years that we have really started doing a lot of work in um, and that we love is in the explainer video field. Mm -hmm. um, those have become very popular and, the, and I think we've probably all seen them if we've been online. They're essentially those videos that combine storytelling and animation with voiceover and music and they're essentially a really compact way of 
clarifying a complex issue or demoing a product's features and benefits. And so we've been um, really fortunate to do quite a few of those in recent years. What sort of clients are you doing those for, Susan? Um, a pretty broad spectrum. So we are working with some startups, so people who are launching new apps. Um, one of the ones that comes to mind is uh, <clears throat> one called Field Lens. Mm -hmm. um, that is a construction job site communication tool. Right. And when they were first getting started, we did their uh, product explainer video for them. And they actually won a bunch of awards last year as being one of the best productivity apps. I'm very proud of them. So that's you know one side of the spectrum. And then we also do a lot of work for um, some bigger brands, we've done explainers for, um, we did a series for Anthem, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Mm -hmm. um, we've done one last year for LinkedIn. Um, and then we do a lot for nonprofits, which actually is really great because sure. they tend to have these very complex issues that they're working um, with and right. they're trying to rally support around. And so <clears throat> we've done we did one for UNICEF, we did one for World Vision, um, and we've done a series for the uh, George Bush Presidential Center around some of the, the things that they're working on. So we did one about 9-11 vets who are coming back from a war. We did one about um, immigration and the role of immigrants in America. And we just did uh, one very recently that launched uh, probably two weeks ago about women in Afghanistan. Really what a fascinating, project. yeah. What a wide <laughs> range of clientele. Do they find you? Do you find them? How does this come about? Um, we, uh, we were very fortunate because we were getting interested in this area before it became as popular as it is now. And mm -hmm. so we were one of the kind of early <laughs> adopters of this style of sure. um, video production. And so a lot of our clients, I think, found us because there weren't too many <laughs> companies doing that early on. Um, and now we have enough of a portfolio um, and a reputation that they're finding us. That's terrific. So, That's wonderful. Yeah. One of my favorite specialized services that you offer is your remarkable Christmas <laughs> mailer, which I'm delighted to say it's I receive each year. It's not technically a service. It's but not really <laughs> a service, but it's a wonderful thing. I, I'm truly, de it's delightful. It's such a delightful thank you gift for your clients. But it also makes, um, it's, it's such a wonderful opportunity for your team to really do what they want to do right. without the pressure of a, a client approval or without That's the right. pressure of, you know, you really get to be self-indulgent once a year yes. and do that. How, how did that come about? That was such a beautiful thought. Um, well, I think you, you really hit the nail on the head. Uh, we probably started doing these um, maybe seven or eight years ago, and mm -hmm. it really was us saying, oh, you know, we've done a lot of really corporate projects. Sure. And we want to do something really fun, and nothing really fun was coming our way. And so um, we started small, and then it's gotten out of control uh, <laughs> over the years. Um, we treat each one as an opportunity to learn a new skill set, learn about a new production process. So sure. over the years, we, we've done things like um, a letterpress poster that was an explainer infographic about, the, the, about Jingle Bells. Jingle Bells. Right, yeah. the song Jingle Bells. Which has a lovely Savannah connection right? as well. Yeah, <laughs> um, we did um, a custom deck of cards mm -hmm. one year. We did one of those little fun uh, viewfinder toys um, with custom graphics. Uh -huh. um, and then this, this past year, right. we did, um, we actually used it as an excuse to <laughs> launch a new product line that we've just started, which is a wrapping paper product line called Paragon Papers. So when no one was looking, you decided to launch a, a product actually, right? This yes. is the first time. The, yes. Tell, tell us about Paragon Papers. So uh, we work in print design, and one of the uh, things that we have developed a little bit of a reputation for is doing some edgier, interesting print pieces mm -hmm. than your typical corporate collateral. Sure. Um, it's meant that over the years we've experimented with lots of different press techniques. We have a printer that we work very closely with, and they they're willing to kind of try anything with us and advise us when we come up with crazy ideas. Um, and so the combination of, of working on those client projects and also the holiday mailers um, has really given us the sort of specialized knowledge about 
papers and inks and printing techniques. Oh, yeah. And about three years ago, we started talking about what we could do with that skill set. <laughs> and so wrapping paper seemed like a neat way to, um, to do that. Also, it's, you know, it's something, the type of wrapping paper we thought we could do would be more of a luxury type paper. And mm -hmm. that's something that's growing in popularity. Um, people are spending less on gifts, but are curating the experience of giving the gift uh -huh. a lot more. And so wrapping paper um, has become, you know, was always useful, but it's become, you know, sort of very specialized. Um, and so we figured, you know, we were going to stop talking about it and actually do it. And so we used the holiday mailer as our way to, to launch our first line, which has a glow in the dark paper. It has a paper that looks and feels like leather. And it has another one that has like an interesting textured um, finish applied on it. Um, and we also did provide like a, a little book about wrapping tips. So it wasn't sure. just wrapping paper as those. a gift. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that was a fun way for us to actually get off our butts and, and, sure. and do the product you all line. You just have too much fun over there, don't you? You really do. <laughs> I, I have to compliment you on your team. I mean, you've done a remarkable job of Thank you. hiring the right people. And, and it seems like you're almost adopting these people. They're almost becoming part of your, your family over there. And then they're not over there anymore now. They're scattered far out, and wide. Yeah. Tell me about that. That's interesting. Well, you know, I'm actually very proud of that. We, when we started our company from the very beginning, it was myself and my two partners. We wanted Paragon to be the type of place that we would want to work. Um, and so when we set out to actually begin hiring people, mm -hmm. we really looked for people who weren't just talented, but who were a good match for sure. who we were personality-wise. And I think that's paid off. Our, our team is very close-knit, as, as you said. We are a family, yeah. and our people stay with us. Our, um, <clears throat> we have an employee who will be with us seven years tomorrow, James, who you know. Right. Um, and yes, now we're actually location shifted. So we're, some of us are in Savannah, some in Austin. One is in Richmond, Virginia. Another is in Asheville. Um, and we still are able to maintain that close-knit connection. F 15, 15, 15 years. years? Yeah. So what about the next 15 years? <clears throat> oh, man. Like we're going <laughs> <we're> to have to come up with some new crazy things to do and a lot more uh, holiday mailers. And things are changing. I mean, your industry is changing, obviously. Yes. But you're, you're finding ways to, to constantly address that. And I think um, if we aren't changing and innovating ourselves, then it becomes boring, and why do it? Well, thank you, Susan. Thank, thank you for you, your Murray. time. Really enjoyed it and uh, love to hear the stories. And, Great to talk uh, to you. Thanks for joining us on the podcast.